Hello everyone and welcome to our Gem Pursuit. My name is Matthew Weldon and I'm joined in our magical and mysterious pursuit to the world of antique and vintage jewellery by my trusty co-host Elise Ketcher. Hello Elise. Hello everybody. We've come to the end of our short series, Royal Regalia, A History of Splendour, looking at the stories and histories behind some of the world's most famous crown jewels. We've delved into some of the most fascinating histories and stories from Denmark, Iran and the UK. And we have a very special episode to wrap up this series, which we've absolutely loved doing. Today, we're bringing this series closer to home for us. Although you might not have known this country had crown jewels, we'll find out the history that led to their establishment, their roots back to the British Royal Regalia and also the unsolved to this day mystery of their disappearance. Elise, do reveal what country's crown jewels we're talking about today. Today, it's all about your home country, Matthew. We're going to be focusing on Ireland. Sounds super. And before we start, we have a special guest joining us today who also had a direct link to the Irish Crown Jewels and who was a leading expert on Irish antique silver and antique jewellery, Jimmy Weldon, who is also my father. Jimmy, you're very welcome this morning. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. Let's get into it. So let's talk a little bit first about what were the Irish crown jewels, because a lot of people might not know that they actually existed or they had a set. Yes, I I think it's important to remember with Ireland, we're talking about a country that has these centuries and centuries of history. But the crown jewels that we're talking about today are a direct link to the colonization of Ireland during the time of British rule. So the crown jewels really were an extension, let's say, of the crown jewels that were part of the British monarchy at the time. And they were presented as kind of like a badge of honor to the person who was put in charge of Ireland, let's say the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland by the British monarch at the time, which was King William IV. And he presented the jewels as his kind of stamp of approval, but also for his use when he was in the country in 1831. Yes, and that's what the purpose of these jewels were. But I think it's nice in a way that we do actually have, although we don't have the jewels as they were mysteriously taken, which we will get to, we do have images of them and descriptions of them. So we actually can talk a little bit about what they actually contained, which is quite uh, quite important. And there was a few main pieces. So one of the first main pieces was what they called the Grand Master Star. And this was, an, well, this was described as an eight-pointed star pendant with Brazilian diamonds, which were quoted as being like the purest water. So you know, at this stage, we're talking about alluvial deposits of diamonds, probably type 2A, uh, which means they had a, a very high purity and they almost resembled water. Um, so, Jibby, if you're, for instance, you have dealt with a lot of type 2A diamonds in your career, and in particular, the historical diamonds that we see from the Golconda mines in India and also the Brazilian mines. What is the difference or what do they, what is the typically their allure as a gemstone? Well, I suppose it can be described almost as mystical. Type 2A diamonds or diamonds from Golconda are slightly harder than other diamonds. They are the hardest known stone. Um, they have the most amazing lack of colour. It's like, they're like a mountain stream. And the old term, where today we talk about a decolour diamond as being the finest, the old times, they used to speak of diamonds being of the first water. So a diamond of the first water would be today's decolour diamond. But the Golconda diamonds and the diamonds, the type 2A, slightly harder, which gives them the magical watery look. And it's, as I say, it's, it's almost mystical because of the historical 
connection between rocks and water in a mystical sense. So they are, and uh, these diamonds in the, the Irish crown jewels were of the very finest colour or colour, less lack of colour, um, and the highest grade that is imaginable. And they would have this magical property uh, of, of um, luminescence, if that's the word, radiance too is another nice word I always like. Well, it's easy to see why, you know, that they were part of a of a jewellery collection previous to being part, owned by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland because there was around 394 precious stones that were in the collection um, that were made into these pieces that Matthew was talking about, but they all came from the English crown jewels to create the set and they were sourced directly from Queen Charlotte's, uh, from her own booty, shall we say, of, of gems. So as Jimmy was saying, like you can imagine it was fit for royalty, but also a historical uh, collection of stones that, you know, oozed kind of this magical quality. And, you know, hearing that description, it's just, again, such a pity that we actually couldn't see them today or that they couldn't be put on display somewhere and I mean, as you said, they're they're from Queen Charlotte's collection, which is why they are crown jewels, because they did come from the crown and they were owned by the crown, technically. Uh, although, as we'll get into, their exact storage and handling was quite interesting. But yeah, as, as we talked, they had the Grandmaster Star and then they had the Grandmaster Badge and then there was also five gold collars. The Grandmaster Star was valued at the time as... £14,000. So this will give you a sense of the importance of these pieces, set with these beautiful white, white diamonds, watery looking diamonds uh, in the good sense. That equates to £1.6 million today. Uh, oh, it would be worth so much. Like, Jimmy, what would be the worth of the crown jewels today if you could get them? It would be well over one6 I say, oh, yeah, That's just one piece. Yeah, yeah. it's absolutely well, uh, anything that has such amazing provenance. Uh, it, it, it is in a way priceless because you, nobody can imagine what somebody else would give for something of that sort of thing. And they don't come on the market. You know, they, the jewels of that kind of royal jewels rarely come on the market. And when they do, they fetch immensely more money than they would be worth uh, objectively as, as, uh, as their intrinsics. My, my feeling is that, uh, and you, I'd love to hear your input on this one, that that's a much more recent thing. But when you start, you know, you were in the business in the, 60s, maybe 60s, 70s. He wasn't. But. He wasn't around <laughs> right at 1831 when they yeah, were yeah. gifted, but it was close. It's close, but <laughs> it, but, with, but what I but it's the provenance thing. It's huge these days. If you see a royal jewel, I mean, the price, as you said, go, goes way beyond the intrinsics. But it's even but was that always the case? I feel, or is it a more recent phenomenon? I don't know. I, I suppose it goes back, you know, to, I'm thinking of the uh, Charles II gave a lot of wonderful jewels to, well, his girlfriends at the time, Nell Gwynne being one of them. And that type of provenance, I know it's not exactly the same thing as being royal jewels itself, but uh, any kind of interesting historical provenance, fascinating provenance uh, links with these people who have gone before adds immensely to the attraction of a jewel and the story of a jewel. So, yeah, yeah, I think it, that goes back a long way. Yeah, it is. It is the story, though. You know, we we deal in antique and vintage pieces on a day to day basis. And really, at the end of the day, it is the story of even the time period that the pieces were made in that mm. really mm. attracts people to these these pieces, you know, when it's handcrafted and you can see the design from the period. And you mentioned at least that they were given by King William the Fourth, I think, originally. Yes. And with the connections between these two islands historically, sometimes difficult historically, but at the same time, like King William the Fourth, when he was Prince William, he fought in a battle off the coast of Southern Ireland, of Cork. There was all these and and he was victorious and it was commemorated in a gold box given to to him by the Cork Corporation of Cork. 
so there was there's men as neighbors historically for so many you know for forever there's always connections going to and fro uh, and I think the history of our countries is fascinating very difficult at times but fascinating and contributes greatly to the interest of of these jewels uh, and they're the only to my knowledge Irish crown jewels that ever existed People themselves, King William had connections, great connections with Ireland, as did George the Fourth. It's fascinating, and if you objectively look at the connection between Ireland and England uh, historically, it always fascinates me how how we've interacted and uh, times have changed. Obviously, and the the crown jewels are linked to this in so intrinsically, I think, and very closely. Well, I think it was a very interesting time in Ireland when the crown jewels it actually go missing because it was there was a strong you know independence movement at the time and obviously the crown jewels were symbolic of unity in fact even on the crown jewels the insignia on them or the words engraved onto the back was and here's for our latin scholars see if they can translate it but uh, i might not say it correctly anyway but it's keys separ abit is which means who, who will separate us who that, will that, separate that's us, a yeah. quote, i think that's a quotation from st paul's from Paul's letter to somebody or other, I think. I I wouldn't I wouldn't put my hat in the ring with these two because I'm not a Latin scholar. But I mean, <laughs> so a lot, I know when to bow out. Well, well you are a biblical scholar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Latin was a school subject here. Not that long ago, actually, I know so. that's why I'm like, uh, if it was in Japanese, I might be able to tell you a little bit about it. Well, speaking of Latin and Japanese, I'd also just like to point out that when we're recording this, it uh, is actually. Uh, what they call Shockton Naguelga, which is another interesting reason to speak about the Irish crown jewels. It's an Irish word that means it's Irish week where everyone has to make a, an effort to speak a cupola fuckle, which is a few words, osgwelga, and uh, in Irish. So uh, if you hear a few words you don't recognise, that's just me interjecting with uh, Irish words. So Believe me, everybody, it is a lot harder than what you can imagine. Because if you look at any of even the names and the pronunciation of Irish is a very, very difficult language. So let's talk just a little bit about what, now we, we've described the jewels and there's fantastic photos online. You can Google them, you can see nice detailed descriptions. And we'll we will, also have them in the show notes. Yes. So if you want to look them, just go to our show notes and you'll be taken directly to them. Now, key to understanding the Irish crown jewels. You can't mention them without mentioning that they're gone. <laughs> Now, so, but it's key. You can't mention them without mentioning that they're gone. <laughs> but the key point is to understand where they were kept, right? Because it's also in a, in a historic building in Dublin, which is has so many facets and elements to it that we could discuss about, uh, which was Dublin Castle. But their, their storage was super important to understand. Yes, but I just want to point out, because like this is where it gets a little fishy for me personally, if I was the person who was looking into the these jewels going missing. Up until 1903, they were actually housed in a bank vault. And this it was a lot more secure and you know, had to give, uh, you had to go to the bank, to the vault to access the jewels. And then in 1903, it was decided that they would be moved into a safe in the, in the castle's Bedford Tower. Right. So they then decided in 1903 that they were going to put it there, but then the strong room that was there was... was Purpose built for <laughs> to, ho- to house them. Yes, but it actually didn't fit the safe in the tower. Yes, yeah, so it was so, a, minor, a minor oversight. So um, an Ir- Irish it, problem, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> this is like where it's like, come on, guys. Like, this is your... These are uh, really important. And... The carpenter's daughter would have measured that. <laughs> Yes, I would have. So it didn't actually end up going into the strong room because it wouldn't fit through the doorway. So then they decided that they would put it into the castle library instead because that's where it fit. Which is right beside it. Yes, but I mean, like, I know. Not a strong room. (laughs) It's not a strong room. And so then there was like this 
the duty of like taking care of the jewels fell on the Ulster King of Arms, who was Sir Arthur Vicar Vickers, who looked after the keys. Now, tell us about this, Mister or Sir Vickers, because again, well, this didn't sound like a safe pair of hands to me. No, not a safe pair of hands. But, I mean, <laughs> Mister Vickers, he he had a bit of a reputation, right? So he, as you said, he was the Ulster King of Arms, and his responsibility, or one of his responsibilities, was the custody of the crown jewels. He was the one who actually designated the terms at which they would be stored. He said that they needed to have a safe room. He said that there had to be a safe in so, the safe room. So it was his fault that the safe didn't fit into the safe room. Yeah, and he kind of, so, but that's where, that's where it starts for me is that because he was responsible for it. So the fact that he made an error or it was an oversight, you know, he, he didn't want to draw too much attention to it because it was just quite expensive to build this room, which, so he was like, okay, well, let's just put it in the library. Well, so that was the first thing, but he also, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask Jimmy, because Jimmy has spent a lot of time up and around Dublin Castle, because it's actually where the um, assay office is as well, is in Dublin Castle. Like, do you think it would a secure location choice for the, the crown jewels? Oh, yes. The Dublin Castle would have been very secure uh, as it was the heart of the British government's occupation situation in Ireland. And it was, oh, it, the castle was always considered very secure. You mentioned the Assay Office. Now, the Assay Office wasn't there until I think 1922. It didn't come there after the burning of the Custom House. Yeah, the, the castle would be considered very secure and safe. So the, the jewels, they would have thought of the jewels as being very safe within the walls and within an extra safe room. They so would, yeah. it's really the, the custodian who we would blame in this situation. Well, there's a wider story, I think, isn't there? <laughs> Is, you can't just hang it on on for, for Well, I just want to I just want to point out. So let me just because I've I've looked at this particular character, Sir Vickers, and he wasn't, like I said, a safe pair of hands. Number one, there's an instance where he actually locked himself out of Bedford Tower. So couldn't get back into where the jewels were anyway because he locked himself out. Um, Happened to anyone really. <laughs> yes. But he also enjoyed showing off the jewels to his friends. Um, and he was known to regularly misplace his keys. So he didn't know where they were, which would leave it open to the key being dubbed um, so that people could get in there. Also, the library was also his waiting room. So he had visitors constantly passing through where the safe was. So it wouldn't really be like where you have your safe in any kind of jewelry or anything that's precious, you know, where you're trying to keep it. It's supposed to be kept out of sight so that people don't know where it is, how to get to it, and also, you know, how to access the locks and things like that. But also several weeks prior to this, he had had a security breach where one of his friends at a party, his name was Lord Haddo, actually took his keys, stole the jewels and then returned the jewels to him by post. Yeah, this is where it starts to get just... So like yeah. all in the name of fun, right? Ha ha, you lost the jewels, like took them, but then they arrive back in the, in the post. So like there's a lot of instances where it's like, okay, the security of the jewels was an issue under the stewardship of this particular character. I mean, it sounds like that room, the, it was the waiting room, so it would have had a lot of people coming through it. But the background there as well is that, you know, Sir Arthur Vickers enjoyed a party and <laughs> not to stereotype, but... A Who drink, doesn't? A drink. So, I mean, there was all sorts of people going in and out of there. There was also a lot more keys than had been originally intended. So there's two safe keys that Sir Arthur Vickers kept on him at all times. But let's remember, he also drank a lot and, you know, passed out. So there was, at these parties, there was plenty of opportunities for people to get a hold of these keys. You know, there was also several keys to the strong rooms and seven 
being seven keys to the front door of the tower. So lots of people had access to this tower. I suppose, though, in fairness, it was a t- different time. You know, the early part of, of the century, there was very little crime, very little theft would have been very rare. And I think in a way, Vickers reflects that, his actions reflect that. I don't think he expected any serious problem. Um, he was and trusting. He was trusting. And, but it was a time when theft was rare. Yeah, you know, that's, 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 rare. that's, that's mm. fair. Because mm. today, like you, you really wouldn't leave anything in Dublin Castle, on <laughs> <laughs> like not bolted to the ground, you know, you really wouldn't. Yeah, no, uh, in, the, in any of these things, sometimes when you say the facts out of context from the time that they happen, they sound bizarre. But actually, if you were there, you might have thought, oh, sure, that's just the way it was. And it seemed probably quite reasonable. Obviously, now I haven't known the outcome, it seemed. Um, it seems strange, but that was the way it was. And, and there is other <laughs> elements to it as well. So, but one day, obviously, they went MIA. At least what happened to them? <laughs> Nobody knows, Matthew. I think that's that's the that's the issue. So it was on the afternoon of Saturday, the sixth of July, that an office messenger actually entered into the safe, and luckily he actually had one of the golden collars. So he was actually taking one of the golden collars back to be placed with the rest of the crown jewels. And that's when it was officially realized that the jewels were gone. Yeah. And he was returning that from West and Sons, which were a big uh, retailer in, in Ireland, not around anymore, but they were there until nine, or 2006 or seven, I Two, believe. 2008, wasn't it? 2008. Something very, very recent. Anyway, there for a very long time. And, you know, it, there's going to be so many twists and turns in this story. And the messenger who, dis- who discovered that the safe was unlocked and that they were missing inadvertently locked the safe when he was noticed this which you know <laughs> as you would you were like oh, I wasn't here which like <laughs> would delay, but delay the investigation even a little bit longer but the uh, the police investigation only actually began I feel like we're doing a crime podcast now um, but the investigation by the police only started three days after they were noted missing because Sir Arthur Ricketts needed to be present for the investigation, but he claimed to be unavailable, which again, might have been, you know, but... Uh, but also, you know, if your friend had taken the jewels at a party and then sent them back via post, you'd probably be sitting there like praying that they came back in the post, wouldn't you? You'd be like, yes. maybe they came, they're going to walk through the door in the post and he's like sitting there. Because also, as Jimmy rightfully said, Sir Arthur was obviously in a different time period. He was more trusting. Also, his personal treasures were in the safe as well. So a, a lot of his own personal items were taken from the safe. So it shows that, you know, he probably was sweating having his own things gone as well and really, really hoping that they were going to come back in some way. Yeah. I mean, unless he was planning to sell them all anyway. <laughs> no, but it's... It, that, yeah. That that does. I mean, he, he, I know his his family jewels are valued at about one hundred and seventy thousand pounds at that time. So, I think he would mentioned there was no forced entry to the safe, so the safe was, but it was regularly unlocked anyway. So, there was also a ribbon and clasp which was attached to one of the badges that was left behind in the safe. Now, they say you know uh, Jimmy and Elise from adjustable jewelry. It's fiddly. It takes a long time to disconnect things and reconnecting. So it's said that it would have taken at least 10 minutes to do this, remove this ribbon and clasp. So it seems like the people who took them were not under any time pressure at all, uh, which again suggests an inside job. So it's, again, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to say, and there's quite a few possible outcomes. But what would have been the feeling of the the day, Jimmy, like of them going missing? Like, would it have been top news or would it have been hush hush? Or like, was it something that became widespread knowledge or did it kind of trickle through? <clears throat> I suppose it would have been quite big news when it came out. And obviously, as you say, Sir Arthur Vickers didn't want it known 
in in the beginning that there was a problem because he wasn't sure that there was a problem yeah. in the, the first few days. But uh, when it became clear that there was a serious problem, yeah, it did become quite... And it was King Edward the Seventh was coming to Ireland, wasn't he, at that time? Mm. And uh, he was none too pleased and let it be known that uh, he was none too pleased that these things, had these uh, jewels had gone missing. So... Um, that was all adding to the pressure on the police and you know and everybody to get the, the, the things back, but uh, to no avail, unfortunately, in the short term, anyway. Yeah, so mm. that's a really good point, Jimmy, because a lot of people think that that might have had something to do with it. That you know the visit of the current ruling British monarch to British uh, to Irish soil. And the jewels going missing only two weeks uh, prior to his visit here, they thought that maybe that that had a connection to them going missing. Yeah, well, and, and I think it's absolutely fundamental to understand that because let's not forget this is only a few years before the 1916 rising. So there, there is a strong nationalist movement. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, Jimmy, the two islands are inextricably linked and there's different times in the history when there's different movements, but at that time there was a strong nationalist movement, and the timing it see it's it seems coincidental, and that's a different element that again has to be considered in ultimately in their disappearance. Now I think it's key that we discuss the other possible things that could have happened. And Jimmy, I believe we have a a direct link in the family to these crown jewels because it's said that... <laughs> Jimmy's looking, he's like, probably not a direct link, <laughs> but a, a, maybe a, a link to the recovery or trying to recover these jewels. Yeah. yeah in, in, in What happened was subsequently there were two separate approaches from someone offering to return the crown jewels on payment of a ransom, if that's the correct word. And uh, my grandfather was approached by President Cosgrave with regard to that because um, there was a letter, grandfather received a letter, grandfather, who was a namesake, Jimmy Weldon, he had worked in Kelly's West Warren Street jewellers who were there until the 60s, I think, perhaps, uh, fine jewellers in West Warden Street. And he would have known a great deal of uh, the people who were moving and shaky in those days. Grandfather did, because he worked in, in, in fine, those fine jewellers. And uh, he received an approach offering to return the crown jewels on payment of a ransom. And he... Uh, approached President Cosgraves, who he knew because they, they lived quite close to each other and they, they used to walk out together on Sundays and that. And I think President Cosgraves took a pragmatic view about it. He was quite happy to, uh, having considered it, he was quite happy to pay a, a fairly modest ransom to re, to retrieve the jewels. Uh, interesting enough, because the jewels would have been the property of the Crown still. They weren't, they weren't belonging to the Irish nation. And I was thinking this morning, actually, that the sentiments were different probably on both sides of that particular fence. In Ireland, they would have been seen correctly as a symbol of British rule or close to that. And uh, whereas today, nostalgia has kicked in to some extent and we think of them as ours. And in fact, they were belonging to the crown. Uh, but anyway, he was approached, uh, grandfather was approached about the matter anonymously. It was decided that they would try to to gain the crowns or to recover the crowns, the crown jewels. And at some, now there were two different occasions and I'm getting a slightly muddled of both of them. The, the second occasion, I think it was the second occasion, he travelled to London to meet someone uh, on the Edgware Road to 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 uh, recover the jewels. And because President Cosgrove had agreed to pay a ransom, I think it might have been £3,000 was asked, which was a lot of money at the time. But, um, Anyway, it eventually never came to anything substantial. The jewels were not, to the best of my knowledge, recovered. But 
It was said too in the family that when grandfather Jimmy Weldon died in 1950, that he still had the letter that was written uh, by whoever. It was thought maybe it was by Shackleton, uh, a guy who was one of the suspects at the time, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but he had the letter, but unfortunately when he died, it became lost, it was thrown out or whatever happened. But um, he did, he, the grandfather did travel to London to try and uh, effect a recovery. and But the thing went cold eventually. So unfortunately, that didn't come to anything. And that was the last really that <clears throat> was heard. There was no further approaches that I'm aware of that happened subsequently in relation to the Crown Jewels. It was believed that they were in a, locked in a safe in Dublin somewhere, in a locked safe. Um, but it was never established as that was true or where they were, uh, and they disappeared. Unfortunately, that was the end of us from the grandfather's point of view. So, like, this is this is fascinating, number one, and to have a direct link to the possible recovery of such important jewels, especially to the country. But what do we think really happened to them? Like, if you were to throw your hat in and we were to say where they could possibly be today, honestly, where, where we'll start off with Jimmy, where do you think they are? <laughs> I, <laughs> He's like in my safe at home. No, <laughs> I have absolutely no idea, and that is the truth. Though, though, I mean, within the family, there were one or two differing views about it, uh, which I won't go into. But uh, <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. Uh, it would be wonderful if they were to be recovered. Wouldn't it be wonderful? I mean, it, it, they would have to be sorted out, I suppose, in terms of ownership and whatever. But um, it would be wonderful. It would be, and they they are extremely historical, and because of the uh, the royal connection to them and that, and the interaction of the islands, they they would have been viewed by the nationalist thing of which the grandfather was obviously in that persuasion. Um, they they would have been viewed differently than say the likes of uh, Edward the Seventh would have seen them. So and they 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 they, they were complex uh, as the relationship between the islands is complex. But it would be wonderful to have them restored to to be found and restored and maybe on an exhibition in Ireland or whatever. But uh, whether that'll ever happen, who knows? It's possible that they were broken up. Who knows too? Because that's the, where that's yeah. where I would throw my hat in. Mm. I would say mm. that if I you know, if the if I had these jewels and I had stolen them and they were very recognisable mm, mm. as what they were, um, a bit like the the necklace um, that Marie Antoinette was kind of you know tied up with, it was basically broken up. It was never kept as the necklace. All of the stones were taken apart and they were kind of sold off as pieces because as you said, the stones will always have a value. The stones will always be wanted. Um, but the, as you, the very point that you're making, at least that the, the stones themselves wouldn't be recognisable uh, when loose. I mean, you could yes. suspect me perhaps, but they wouldn't be recognisable. But it, now again, it, it, that begs another question. If that were to have happened, um, it would be. It would have to have been done by an expert jeweler. You yes. know, you couldn't. You couldn't um, take a piece apart, a piece like that, or those items to to take the, the stones away. But that may have happened. But um, I doubt anybody alive today knows exactly. You know, who knows? It's one of the mysteries. No, I don't think anyone knows. I think it's. I think it's a good point, at least. To, to, if someone stole them, they wanted to realise the value and it would have been impossible to do that as they were because they were so distinctive. Yeah. So. I mean, it's also like, as you said, it, it, it could have been a political coup to kind of, hello, we stole the crown jewels and the and the monarch is about to come over and he can't wear them. They're not here anymore. So, you know, there is there could be a political element behind it as well. We'll never know. But, you know, the value of the pieces 
as they are together are too recognizable for the person who stole them to realize that value. So to realize any kind of value, I personally think they probably would have had to have had help to break them up. But um, unless you have uh, another theory, Matthew. No, I mean, I, I think I mean, it's the name that came up there with Shackleton, you know, and it was Francis Shackleton, who was the brother of the explorer, Ernest Shackleton. You know, when, grand, when my uh, great-grandfather, your grandfather, went to London, it was, yeah, I'm not so clear who he met, but it was said that the person resembled Francis Shackleton. Now, he is a key suspect in the in the robbery of the Irish crown jewels. Who, uh, who is this person? He, he was, so the, the explorer, Ernest Shackleton, was his brother. Now, his brother was, at the time, is this, bed, is this had significant financial difficulties. He was actually eventually prosecuted and imprisoned for, in the end, defrauding a spinster. So um, that's he enjoyed a party. He, he spent a lot of time with Arthur Vickers. Uh, he, and actually, funny enough, Shackleton uh, ultimately became an antiques dealer in Chichester in England. Uh, wow. He died in 1941. <laughs> uh, doesn't, this isn't looking too good for him, is it? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's not. But it's, it's, it's also said that the, the robbery was kept hush hush because Francis Shackleton, Sir Arthur Vickers, and it was said that it was, uh, they were homosexuals, which was illegal at the time. So it's said to avoid further embarrassment that they just didn't talk about it. And I know there was a reward given, but, it, it, you know, there's so many layers to the investigation that. Uh, that's another element that was it. Did they decide to avoid a scandal in Dublin Castle? Did they just brush well, over it? Was, um, was Shackleton um, Irish or English? He's Irish. He's Irish, I think. Yeah, He, he may have been Anglo-Irish. I don't know that, but he, he was Irish, definitely. Okay. Because um, like I'm trying to think about the political, his political standing, like mm. is he, he st- standing as a, you know, for the crown or a, a national? I'd say it was just, if, if, it, if it was him, it, it was just a theft for, for because he, for he money. needed money. I'd say yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. But he, but he <laughs> economic the, person. He also wasn't in the country at the time. But yeah. it was well documented that he wasn't in the country at the time. Yeah. So it seemed yeah, like a so good an alibi. alibi. <laughs> <laughs> but his, one of his potential lovers was in the country at the time and was very friendly with Sir Arthur Vickers, which is Richard Gorgeous. Uh, he he ended up actually going to jail. What a name, Richard Gorgeous. <laughs> I don't think, I think I it's want that surname. G-O-R-G-E-S, Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah, but like the way that you guys say it, it sounds like gorgeous. <laughs> he, he, he ended up shooting a policeman. And, oh, uh, okay, maybe he, not. In 1944, <laughs> well, he was actually killed by, after being hit by a train. So, poor old Sir Arthur Vickers lost his life in the Troubles as well afterwards, is, which yeah, was unfortunate was, too. But Really? Uh, How did, did he lose his life? He was assassinated by the yeah, IRA yeah, in yeah, Kerry in 1921. Yeah, yeah. But you see, the other thing that that is perhaps interesting and worth looking at, has been looked at, I'm sure, the, the Irish government records at the time too of what was going on. Um, the, 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 there are, it is recorded, I think, that uh, there were attempts made to recover the jewels but the government would have known all about it, obviously, and uh, perhaps some of the details were left out of the records, as, as you would expect they might be. It might be too delicate to put in, you know. So um, who knows? But it's, it's just one of these mysteries. One but, of my questions hmm. for you, Jimmy, is if they were recovered today and we did get them back, because we are in Ireland now a independent country, the jewels... They don't belong to Ireland, no. or do they? No, they belong to the Crown still. They would still be the property of the Crown. That's my understanding of it. So uh, they would be removed from Ireland then and taken to... Well, well, it's quite possible. I was just thinking about that thing. It's quite possible that Britain would gift them to Ireland. Some, I, I don't know, it, but it would be a very good thing and pleasant thing and uh, political thing to politic thing to do I think but who knows uh, but if they were recovered uh, they would they kind of belong to Ireland but it builds into the complexity of the relationship between I feel like Britain. I feel like that the the monarchy would leave them here I kind of feel like yes I, I'm inclined to think they would yeah because well, they hmm. have they have um they have, they have a, well <laughs> <laughs> they have a Scottish royal jewels as well but they aren't allowed to leave 
that aren't Scotland. allowed to leave Scotland. Yeah, yeah. So they stay in um, Edinburgh Castle and the Queen or the King, the reigning monarch, when they come to Scotland are able to use them when they're there, but they're not allowed to remove them. But because we currently don't have any ties to England as a sort, like as with well, sovereignty. If, 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 they were, if they turned up in Britain, say, for example, if yes. they were to turn up in Britain, it would have to be obviously a conscious decision, uh, you know, a clear decision by the British government uh, as to which direction they should go in. Uh, and they, they would either be kept in the royal collection, I expect, or they would be gifted to Ireland, which would be wonderful if that were to have yeah, happened. You know, I think they happened. should gift them to Ireland. Just, just say. The first thing is to find them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing, and, and this is another layer of this, which is interesting, is that a detective from Scotland Yard was sent over because they were unimpressed with the investigation here. He did a report where he named the culprit, but this report was suppressed by the Royal Irish Constabulary and it was never actually released. What? That is really saucy. I, so, and has that been released now since it's been no, so many years later? Listen, that that is 117 years ago. That report is probably buried somewhere in Scotland Yard, I'd imagine. But it exists, I'd say. L- lastly, before we finish, I just want to kind of before because we're we're wrapping up now before we finish is would there be anything today like where's the gold necklace the last gold necklace that was in the safe that they were taking back after everything was robbed where is that i was curious yeah because like there has to be because i know that there's a box that actually held it that box is somewhere the last necklace is somewhere but where where is it? I couldn't find any kind of trace evidence of where those things are kept today. Well, I just I meant to say this earlier when you mentioned Wests that they Wests uh, were the royal jewelers in Ireland. They had the royal uh, what's the word I'm looking uh, for? A royal seal, like yeah, they were the, they, appointed by the appointed queen. Point, yeah. yeah, 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 and they had served the crown, the royal few, warrant, the royal warrant. Yeah, That's so. Um, they they would have uh, you know been close to that sort of thing, and they would be completely trusted uh, with 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 whatever crown jewels were or royal jewels were around at the time. But they, it was regarding the residue of what there was. The, the the it's an interesting point. I suppose eventually it might have been melted down, but I don't know. Goodness knows. Oh well. my god! Well, what would you do with a piece of you know? I don't know. Goodness knows. Mm. And. Interestingly, uh, there was a reward of £1,000 that was offered for the return of them, just a general reward, and that has still been unclaimed and it's still valid as far as I can figure Only out. Only £1,000? Well, that was in 1907, so that's... But is that is currently still standing. If you bring forth the jewels today, you'll get £1,000. I imagine it's... Yeah, index to inflation, but oh, I yeah. hope so. <laughs> I'd be like, I'd be like, oh, I think I'll keep it for the just to look at it. It's yeah. prettier than like getting a thousand pounds, well, isn't I mean, it? I mean, it's definitely it's it's. If anyone did find them, as you say, it would be it'd be so interesting. I hope it's going to be us that we find them. Um, Somebody, if you have the crown jewels, please offer them to us. We would be very happy to see them. Um, yeah, and the our reward will probably be a lot more than a thousand pounds. But we'll do one thousand and one pounds. And one pound. <laughs> so, with all those theories and mysteries. I don't know if it'll ever, ever resolve exactly what happened to the Irish crown jewels. But regardless, I really hope you enjoyed listening to this story about the crown jewels from Ireland. Now, we've come to an end of our Royal Regalia a History of Splendour series, and we have absolutely enjoyed it. It's been a blast. Do let us know what you thought and if you'd like us to cover more crown jewels in the future. We will be back, however, with a new series next week, which we can't wait to reveal. If you enjoy our podcast, please do click follow on your player so you can get the episodes automatically. And better again, do share our podcast with a friend of yours who also likes antique jewellery. It really helps the podcast grow. And the more we grow, the better research we can do and the better guests and stories we can get. 
As always, a big thank you to my trusty co-host, Elise Ketcher. Thanks, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. A massive thank you to our researcher, Veronique Gauguin, who's joined us this year, who does her research from Paris and has had it added a great element to the podcast. And of course, to our podcast producer, dustpod.io. And of course, I couldn't finish this series without saying a special thank you to Jimmy Weldon, uh, my father, who joined us today, who gave a fascinating insight into the attempted recovery of the Irish crown jewels. Great pleasure. Until the next time for me, Matthew Weldon, chat to you soon.